This is United Medical ACO weekly event, and uh, my name is Kamal Erkin. I'm the chairman of United Medical ACO. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, sorry we were not able to be with you last week. Today is June 4th, uh, Friday, 2021. This is United Medical ACO weekly event. And uh, my name is Kamal Erkin. I'm the chairman of United Medical ACO. Uh, as usual, we have uh, some similar uh, uh, updates, some updates from our similar items, uh, prior items, and then we have a couple of guests. But today's uh, highlighted guest is going to be uh, the CEO of uh, YWCA Delaware, um, Stephanie Stats, which is going to be with us. And in the next 10 minutes, she'll be joining us. Uh, but I'm going to ask Tanner to join me, and then we can start giving you the COVID 19 update. And after that, uh, we'll be with uh, YWC, YWCA. All right, Tanner, you are mm -hmm. on. All right, thank you very much, Kamal. So as Kamal mentioned, we're going to start off with some of our um, regular updates, uh, particularly taking a look at the rate of vaccination, um, starting here uh, locally in the state of Delaware. So as we can see up here, Delaware is just over 50% now of its population has been vaccinated. Uh, you can see that on that top line is what is uh, being shown here on our path to 75% or that herd immunity. So being just over 50%, we keep an eye on how that's affecting the seven day rolling average of uh, new positive cases as well. And we're seeing a continued decline in that. Um, so where is the United States um, actually in the rate of vaccination as well? So we've actually dipped under the 1 million um, doses per day mark for the first time. Uh, really since I want to say back in February, you can kind of see that shown on the right side here with our trend graph as well. Um, so that is just keeps pushing out uh, at the rate of which we are vaccinating when we will be able to get to the 75% covered uh, for population of the country as a whole. We're looking at about the six month mark um, at the current rate of, um, of our vaccination. So with that being said, um, we're taking a look at then on the country as a whole uh, with the amount of the population that is vaccinated, where are we looking at with new cases um, on that seven day rolling average or new cases per million here. So the United States uh, just behind Delaware when it comes to percent of population um, that is vaccinated means Delaware is slightly um, ahead of the national average here being that we do have a little over 50% of the population in the state, the United States coming in at about 46% here, um, but that has also current efforts uh, and what we have accomplished so far continue to knock down the um, rolling average for new cases. Um, on so the uh, Tanner, I think our concern is uh, the uh, when the numbers on a daily basis, it was over 3 million, we were gonna be done in the three months, that was two months ago. Now right. that number drastically dropped and that's something that we wanna highlight. So. Uh, if Correct. you are still not vaccinated, please make sure that you reach out to your uh, state uh, health department or your primary care physicians to get the vaccination because the only way that we are able to go through this if everyone is able to get their vaccination completed. Mm -hmm. um, Certainly. So, um, my um, uh, mouse here uh, is a little bit faster than me, so in case. <laughs> it's no worries at all. Just no worries at all. So we do want to um, get into some other uh, updates, news updates, particularly that we are seeing coming out regarding some of the vaccines, some of the other COVID updates that we have. Um, firstly, with the Moderna vaccine. So a few, uh, I guess a month or two ago at this point, what we had talked about was, um, I believe last month, um, the approval of the Pfizer vaccine for uh, use in our adolescent population. So next up would be the Moderna vaccine. 
Um, they have been going uh, through some clinical trials in that same population, that 12 to 17 year old um, population since early February, uh, possibly late January. And we're starting to see some of the results from those studies now. Uh, and that's showing that they have been highly effective in that adolescent population as well. So important to note that this has not been approved uh, for emergency use for this population as the Pfizer vaccine has, that is still currently the only one being used for our pediatric population. Um, but this uh, Moderna vaccine, the Moderna does uh, plan to apply for that emergency use by the FDA um, sometime late this month, hopefully. Uh, so we could see that as another uh, vaccine being used um, uh, to help inoculate against the, the virus. So here we just have a little graphic of some of our um, providers, our pediatric. <clears throat> These are honest Moderna doctors from the United Medical Clinic, right? Correct, yes. So something else I wanted to touch on was a, a new article, some new information coming out regarding the immunity to uh, COVID and how long that's actually going to last for or um, how long people will, will we need booster shots for um, our vaccines after it's initially done? Um, who's going to need booster shots? Maybe how often? It was all something that was still uh, kind of up in the air as um, we do continue to inoculate against the virus. Uh, and as time goes on, this is all stuff that we're still continuing to learn. So something that we're starting to find out now um, is that the immunity cells or your uh, what's going to help you uh, be immune against the virus, um, it's particularly in those people that actually did contract the virus um, at one point, um, they are going to have some of these cells able to survive in the bone marrow. So uh, if you did have COVID at one point and then eventually got uh, vaccinated, um, this study is suggesting that the antibodies are going to persist for uh, years to come. So oh, whereas, in, the, in, in the kind of like practical way, uh, I, got, um, I was infected in April 2020 uh, with my COVID. Like this is a real life story. So mm -hmm. January 2021, I got my first vaccine and March, uh, I believe, early March was the second one. So the chances of me getting reinfected versus someone who's just with two doses is a lot less. Right, and that, that's what uh, essentially this study is starting to, um, to suggest as well. So, and additionally, you're much less likely to need a booster down the road, right? Whereas yep. if someone such as myself who hadn't gotten the virus but did have received both vaccines, there's a much more likely chance that I'm going to need to receive a booster shot. So yep. this is still, of course, um, as I mentioned, as we learn more um, throughout the process of the vaccination, we'll, we'll find out. Um, but Sounds it good. seems like that that's going to be the case. So uh, before we go to the next slide, so I just want everyone to remember what I did uh, say about Dr. Anthony Fauci and some comments that I made regarding his age and job, his being so extremely demanding. Um, I hope I'm on the right slide, by the way. Yep, I am. So it might be a little link, uh, delayed for me. Uh, you, you didn't see it? Not yet. Huh. So right now you don't see the Dr. Fauci slide? I do not know. Now I do. Yeah. Okay. We're on the same page. So um, this is interesting because uh, all the emails that he has received between March and April 2020 um, is being published. And he gets um, uh, thousands of emails every day. And I think he was kind of behind with reading them or he needed other people to help him, which we expect that. But it's a very demanding job and we didn't read everything yet. And I, I don't know if there's any new reports out, but uh, as someone at his age and what this job requires, uh, I think there's a really big disconnect. Uh, demand is extremely high and I wish that they didn't put him in this situation. Uh, but next week or so, we will be getting into those emails and then see if there was something that could be uh, helpful if, we were uh, to react to this problem earlier. So, mm -hmm. I don't know if you wanted to add anything. 
Sure. Well, I, I didn't get to uh, read through many in particular. I did get to read through this article. Um, and certainly, I think some of the interesting points that I took from it um, were just the sheer volume that he was receiving on a day to day basis, really coming from, as he mentioned, colleagues, um, all types of uh, different institutes, academics, uh, and then even just the, he mentions the amount of random people just reaching out uh, and trying to get a hold of him. So um, I think the, the more we are able to, to go in will certainly be interesting as we get to learn a little bit from that perspective, particularly his um, on from what you mentioned was such a demanding job at a very hectic and chaotic time um, early on in the onset mm -hmm. of the pandemic. Um, so I think that that insight is going to be it's going to be pretty crucial to um, not just understanding our situation, but then also being able to um, prepare, as he mentions uh, early in one of his emails, uh, he talks about um, one of the questions he received was what was keeping him up at night from the early on. And it was uh, talking about the uh, possibility of respiratory or some sort of pandemic such as that we had obviously are now still going through. So um, yeah, he wasn't maybe taking enough ambient situations are a, a large uh, a big learning experience so yeah. it'd be interesting well, to get uh, some more of those um, uh, thank you for the uh, COVID-19 updates and sure. now uh, you and I we prep for this uh, these sessions and other than the COVID related items that's how it started mm -hmm. but then we added uh, United Medical um, ACO uh, patient based issues that we could actually discuss in this setting and uh, also just to uh, kind of uh, increase that variety. We added other uh, guest uh, speakers uh, from the state officials to some uh, other uh, organizations. They were our guests. And today, actually, it's, um, uh, I'm going to ask, uh, ask Stephanie Stas to join me. Uh, she's one of my favorite people in Delaware, at least. <laughs> so, Stephanie, you are on mute. Uh, if you can just unmute. Oh. All right, how are you doing? I'm doing well, but I'm a little hurt because I thought I was one of your favorite people, period. Not just- How about East Coast? We can make it East Coast. <laughs> okay, you are, you East are, Coast, are, okay. You are, you are one of my favorite people. <laughs> so it's not, it's not limited by the uh, geography. So, but thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so, I just want to kind of give a little background on how we decided on this. Um, recently, there was an article from our uh, marketing uh, team. They focus on the uh, YWCA and what I do with you guys. And from that, we said, well, why don't we invite uh, Stephanie to our um, uh, live session and then we can actually discuss uh, what you guys do and what how else we can help like different people, how they can get involved. So there are different things that uh, we are going to discuss and anything that you would like to share with our uh, audience. Um, but uh, this is almost 10 years now, right? You and I, we first met uh, and that was through uh, Eileen Donnelly. Uh, and, you know, I was extremely happy from that time to the time that we, uh, we are today and what we were able to do with you uh, and with your organization. So uh, I have a couple slides on our PowerPoint, but if you can uh, please introduce yourself and, and what you do with YWCA, and then we'll go through a couple of the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to spend some time with you uh, today in this forum and uh, you know, to help hopefully to you know, raise some awareness, not only of what we do at YWCA and uh, how important community support is for our work, um, but also to acknowledge the amazing support that we have received from uh, you personally, Kamal, and from uh, the entire United Medical team, uh, which has really done so much uh, to advance our mission, in particular for our families who reside at our homeless shelter in Wilmington. Um, so if you're not familiar with YWCA Delaware, um, as Kamal introduced me, um, I'm the CEO. This will be my sixth year as CEO, uh, but I've been with YWCA for uh, 15 years or so now. The, the years just keep racking up. Um, and one of the reasons that 
have stayed with YWCA as long as I have is because uh, it has really provided me an opportunity for personal growth, both in my you know, professional skill building, um, but also in my personal growth as far as you know, understanding um, really the, the depth and the uh, intricacies of the issues that affect our clients uh, in the space of eliminating racism and empowering women. So that's our mission. And we work toward achieving our mission um, by concentrating in four different programmatic areas. Uh, it's housing, health and safety, economic empowerment, and racial and social justice. And our housing work has been uh, a particular interest of Kamal and the United, United Medical Team. Um, they've been very generous in uh, supporting our, our clients directly in uh, the wraparound services that, that we provide in addition to shelter. Um, and I'm happy to go into more detail about what we do at Home Life Management Center and how we do it, but I'll pause and I'll let you guide me, Kamal, and where we should go next so, in our conversation. Uh, sure, um, I think uh, one of the uh, most important for me uh, was uh, looking for the charity in different ways. Like uh, sometimes when we do this, um, uh, is it meaningful? Is it really impacting uh, the society that we live in? Um, and is it efficient? Um, and what separated the YWCA, for me at least, from any others is the, the approach that you guys have. And that approach is looking into the current situation and then try to help uh, these families and then try to get them back to their life again and improve their lives. So. It's almost like from permanent uh, to temporary setting, which gives them some foundation for the future. If you can elaborate that a little bit, uh, that would be helpful. Sure, sure, thank you. So at Home Life Management Center, um, we comprise really a, an entire city block in West Center City. And what we provide there is emergency and transitional housing for families. Uh, along with the housing, which is literally the roof over your head, um, we provide a lot of support services. And the goal of um, our goal for the families that we serve is that we're not, you know, simply providing shelter. While that is absolutely a basic need and a fundamental right, um, we also understand that in order for a family to be able to live independently. Um, to support themselves, support their children, and really reach their own economic and you know, individual goals. Um, that oftentimes uh, we need to really dive in deep and understand the root causes of their homelessness and help them work through the impact of past trauma, of past incidents, uh, and get strong in those regards practice life skills, practice parenting skills, all those things need to be part of their journey and their time at home life. Uh, so when they leave our program, uh, that they're gonna be uh, successful on their own. And so uh, every family that comes to us is literally homeless. So they are coming to us on an emergency basis. And so our priorities over the first um, week really is to make sure that food, clothing, shelter, um, child care, school connections, all those things are met uh, very promptly, that our families feel safe and secure, that they know that they're safe and secure with us. Um, and then we start to build a relationship between uh, our case managers and the families. We start to build that relationship of uh, trust and kind of shared purpose in their success, of shared interest invested, being vested in their success, and you know, work on developing an action plan with a client um, that most often includes the support services that uh, I mentioned earlier in economic empowerment, in health and safety. We're very intentional at YWCA in what programs we offer and where we offer them. Um, and we find that our economic empowerment and health and safety support services uh, provide the best wraparound for our clients as they're receiving housing. Some of our families uh, only need this kind of emergency period to transition back into independent living. 
Um, but for some of our families, their needs um, and their journey is a lot more intense to um, have them be able to live successfully on their own. For those families, we offer transitional housing. And that is a model uh, that really provides kind of incremental steps to living on your own, um, kind of phasing in, uh, paying a portion of your income towards a room fee, paying uh, for your groceries, making sure that you're preparing your own meals every day. Um, while at the same time, you're still living on site at home life. And uh, we are there if you take a couple steps back, sometimes if you fall, uh, we're still gonna be there to help lift you back up. So there's still this great safety net around our families. Uh, they can stay in transitional housing for up to 24 months. Most of our families don't. Most of our families need anywhere between like 13 to 18 months before they're ready to move on their own, but they can stay up to 24. So uh, you, you used the term, uh, I said temporary, and then you corrected me, I believe, with the transitional housing. So uh, for those who may not know the difference, so uh, if, if it's a homeless shelter, that's permanent, right? So there's different types of housing interventions uh, for the homeless population. And so um, one housing model is permanent mm -hmm. supportive housing. And that's really designed to, um, that's designed for, I guess, you know, highest need individuals who really, for a variety of reasons, are never going to be able to successfully live on their own. So these are structures where, you know, uh, oftentimes it's an individual um, that, you know, there's not even an intention necessarily of, uh, working with them with a goal to live on their own. There is an acknowledgement that they were always going to need some support. And so permanent supportive housing provides that. That's not what we do at YW. Um, at YWCA, we're working with um, uh, the, the segment of the homeless population where it is an emergency need meeting uh, mm -hmm. They need at most up to 60 days of shelter to be able to get back on their feet. Um, it's not uncommon that those families, because we do concentrate working with families as opposed to uh, just yeah. individuals, it's not uncommon that um, families that need just a short stay, so say three weeks in an emergency shelter, that's due to one particular incident that has caused their homelessness. And so we can work to help get them back on their feet after that. It could be mm -hmm. a loss of income. It could be uh, overwhelming debt. Um, in some cases, it could be eviction. And so another intervention that's available is called rapid rehousing. And mm -hmm. that is essentially sort of like rent support, temporary rent support to help a family go from emergency shelter into living outside of the shelter, in the community, but they still need a little bit of help for a couple months to help kind of get them on their way. So their need for support services and case management is often a little bit lower um, than someone who needs to stay in shelter for an extended period of time. So you weren't incorrect, Kamal, when you said it's temporary. It is all temporary. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, use a transitional model to uh, best illustrate what we're doing, which is while this is temporary, it is a transition between emergency shelter and living on your own, because we understand that your needs um, are best met when you have a lower barrier access and a more regular connection to support services. So that can be, for example, the um, program, uh, Kamal, that you and your team uh, designed and launched for us several years ago uh, for individuals who a barrier to their independence is having sufficient earned income to support themselves and their family. And yes. they needed uh, computer skills. They needed training and direction uh, to move into, uh, you know, in the in, uh, and in our case, in that partnership, it was to help them qualify and yeah. be competitive uh, for um, office positions or front desk positions in medical offices. 
Um, and so this is this is the program that we uh, with United Medical Leadership um, we built. It was back in 12, 13, 14 time frame, I want to say. Susan Anderson was leading that. Uh, and I think we are hopefully we are going to maybe do something um, similar for, with that. Uh, the, you know, we did hire people from that program. After the training was done, we hired at least two or three people, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, you know, the, the ripple effects of those two or three people are enormous because, you know, those individuals, um, if they came from our program, which they did, it means that they have families. It means that they have children. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, what these kind of programs can do is they can really break cycles, uh, multi-generational cycles within families, whether it's poverty, homelessness, um, uh, you know, and, and need for external support. Um, that's what these kind of programs can accomplish. And that's what we're about at Why Do You Say? It's about empowerment. Um, it's about uh, you know, with, with us, with our partners like United Medical, it's providing, you know, it's understanding what families need, what their barriers are to being able to, frankly, live their best life and their most fulfilling life, understanding what those barriers are and making sure that we're providing uh, the support that they need, whether it's programs or services, uh, to be able to overcome those barriers. So, uh, Stephanie, I know uh, people can actually get involved in different ways. If um, we can maybe go over those, how, we, how can we help? How can we get involved? Well, thank you. This is a great illustration of some ways that you can help. Um, our website is ywcade.org. Uh, we are constantly freshening that with um, upcoming events, um, with upcoming um uh, current volunteer opportunities. So you can go there anytime and get an up to the minute snapshot of how you can get connected to us. Um, an easy way to always stay abreast of what we offer is to follow us on social media. You know, we do the, um, you know, the big three, if you will, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter uh, are the primary platforms that we use. And, uh, you know, we post regularly and you will see opportunities to get connected through those uh, platforms as well. So certainly um, we are always uh, in need of uh, donations, of contributions from individuals. We do receive grants. We do have some, um, some contracts with uh, government entities. It's not enough. I mean, it really covers the bare minimum. And so in order to really be able to do what we do and achieve the outcomes that we can, we need support. Uh, from people like you, uh, who help us help us fill in those gaps. So certainly through individual donation, um, save the date, October 13th at 8 a.m. is our annual celebration breakfast. And uh, if you go on our website, if you join our mailing list, we'll be sure that you get an invitation, um, an early invitation before it goes out to, to a broader list uh, so you can get the best seat. So it's a wonderful, wonderful event. Um, so you get the, volunteer uh, opportunities as well. So this is, um, I'm actually, I'm just gonna share the website. So in case, um, I know everyone should already know, but uh, so this is our website, right? Let's see. Uh, so that is YWUSA. So we okay. are. And so here I am. <laughs> okay, there we go, okay. there we are. <clears throat> so you see we have a fresh at YW. We just had a panel discussion. Um, last week that's still on there that we, you know, post. that's one thing from going through COVID and mm -hmm. lockdown periods is we very quickly transitioned to delivering um, services and programs virtually. And so now it's become a habit, even as we open up and we can start to do more in person, um, we do um, record our programs that are open to the public and make the link available. Um, so you can check them out at any time. So oh, you mentioned uh, the uh, grants available, um, and I do remember uh, several years ago we had some issues um, with uh, how those being actually allocated to the different uh, shelter programs. And because we do the transitional uh, housing, uh, it was almost like if we weren't included in the shelters, there was something that I remember. And I know that issue was resolved, but are you guys, um, 
or are we getting the uh, enough support from the federal and the state governments? So I wouldn't call the issue resolved necessarily, um, but we are in um, a slightly more secure place than we were. Um, the circumstances you referred to were um, a shift in priorities of funding um, to support emergency shelter somewhat, to, but to more to put more support behind permanent supportive housing, to put more support behind rapid rehousing, which is that program that's essentially like rental assistance for a few months and to take away from transitional housing. And so um, the population that that created the most threat for were families, especially single moms, Mm -hmm. um, and especially families where there was a history of domestic violence. Um, those are some of the, the number, uh, the top reasons that cause uh, women's homelessness. And it follows that the families that we work with in our transitional housing program, uh, these are issues that they face and have to work through. And so the shift in federal priorities to support more community-based housing, um, that's fine for a certain population, but it leaves a large percentage of the population out. So we had to really fight um, to make sure that it was uh, clear and that everyone understood the value of transitional housing, why it was important. Kamal, you were part of making that argument with us, which is extremely helpful. And as a result, because uh, we were really in jeopardy of losing our funding. And if we lost our funding, um, that particular funding stream, we would have to shut down home life management set. Without a doubt, we would have had to shut down transitional housing. So, you know, because of all that effort and because of all that time that went into making sure uh, that the decision makers and the influencers understood uh, what would happen if we had to shut down transitional housing, it did help us to preserve our funding, but it's still in jeopardy. I mean, these are federal priorities on uh, what housing models and, um, you know, some of the, um, you know, factors that weigh into how those priorities are applied on a local level uh, do not work to YWCA's advantage. We are still fully committed to transitional housing. Do you think that's because of the lack of understanding or like there must be something, right? So, and you know, the nice thing, uh, and I, someone who's being uh, outside of US who was born and raised, I can kind of compare different systems. And I think our system here allows us to voice our opinions in a manner that we can reach out to our state officials. And I know Chris Kuhn's um, good friend, and not only he helped uh, with this situation, lately there was a situation with uh, there is a situation with Tigray Ethiopia uh, conflict, and he, uh, I can see how much uh, he wants to help. Now, but it's just one person versus there are, there's an establishment almost where uh, some of these organizations are there on the first in line. So then by the time it gets to uh, YWCA or organizations like y, uh, YWCA, it takes um, a lot of funds away from uh, these uh, people who really need this. Uh, I think that's, do you, do you think that's kind of like the understanding or there's some other maybe underlying issue that we are not aware of? Well, I think that, you know, there's a variety of factors certainly that influence how priorities are set, uh, set at the federal level and how funds are allocated. And I think too that, um, you know, there is an ebb and flow uh, to any uh, social program about what is the best model. And I think that it is not uncommon when there are self-funded studies that those studies will support, um, you know, kind of the thesis or the thinking that you went into it. And so I think that was some of the circumstances that led to, um, you know, this kind of determination that if we only had more permanent supportive housing and if we only had more rapid rehousing dollars, it would solve homelessness. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that the challenge for organizations such as YW is um, 
we don't have, you know, full-time lobbyists. We don't have, you know, whole departments that are there to work on communication strategies to help convey um, who gets left out when we kind of put all our dollars into one um, solution that we kind of self-funded the research on that anyway. Um, so that's why it makes advocates for our work so important. Um, I'll, I'll share with you too that we will be launching uh, an advocacy network and action network over the next couple months. Um, and if you you know sign up for our, our mailing list, I mean we promise you know there's options. We won't inundate you, uh, <laughs> but if you stay connected with us, um, you'll be the first to see how to how to get connected with our action network. Um, because we do need the support of the community to, to lift our voice, to lift our client voices, so they don't get, um, they don't get left out. You know, uh, when I did the first site visit uh, back in 2012, uh, that was a big eye-opening. Now, I mentioned uh, Eileen Donnelly. Um, Eileen is someone who's very special uh, for me. Uh, his, um, and her son, uh, John Donnelly, is... One of our directors, he's in the leadership team. But every time I have uh, different issues that um, like difficult to overcome, I, I would call her and ask for different opinions. And when we got involved with uh, YWCA, uh, one of the first things that we did was a site visit. And I think everyone uh, really should be doing that just to kind of see uh, what you guys have done and how uh, well organized and how efficient and how much there is need for and and for the longevity of uh, the work that you do and the impact that it's generating is creating for the society uh, i have seen so many different charities and i would say uh, ywca is the best uh, charity with the goal with the aim with the uh, mission everything is uh, with the right people like yourself. Uh, and I admire you guys so much that you are able to make this uh, happen. And uh, I think if we can make some more people aware of uh, what's happening with YWCA, I think that's gonna, uh, that's gonna help uh, hopefully long-term for all of us. So uh, Stephanie, thank you so much. Uh, I really do appreciate you joining us. Um, and. Uh, Maybe uh, before the end of the year, we can get together again on this line session because uh, it does help, especially these days. We uh, did um, kind of, uh, we, we, uh, we started taking advantage of the issue with the digital media and then being able to reach out to our patients. But then we realized that we can actually reach out to everyone else. So then this was part of that. And I was, uh, I'm really happy that you were uh, able to join and uh, hopefully we can repeat this again. Yeah, thank you, it'd be my pleasure. And again, I appreciate thank the you. opportunity, everything that you have done for us. And I appreciate you um, just having brought up about what a difference it makes to come see for yourself. Um, because we do offer mission tours. We offer those mm -hmm. site visits. Those are also on our website. We have started to open those up to in-person, but we also do virtual. And that really is the best way to kind of experience and see for yourself uh, what we're about and how important, um, how important it is for us to have advocates and supporters. So come on, I just can't thank you enough. I know I tell you that all the time and I mean it every single time, uh, what a difference you've made to the organization. And um, you are one of my favorite people too. And um, your heart is always you. in the right place and <laughs> you're ready to pull up your, your, your sleeves and get right in there. Um, and we appreciate that so much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, we'll see you soon. Okay. Um, all right. All right uh, so care. thank you. And I believe Donna is gonna join me now. Uh, so, uh, is Donna available? I am here. So before I start crying, I just wanted to... <laughs> <laughs> so they really do a lot of work. Um, yeah. So I know you are also part of uh, what we do there um, uh, and from the UN medical leadership side. And uh, you have seen the efforts and making it meaningful is really important. Um, well, Donna, welcome to our 
<laughs> live session. Thank so uh, we couldn't, uh, YouTube actually sabotaged us last week, so we couldn't uh, go live. Uh, and it was an issue on their side, but we had this um, problem with the hospital numbers. Now, you know, if people are not watching these, show, uh, these sessions with the right mind, they may think that we are just attacking hospitals. Well, that's not the case. Our goal is to utilize uh, the resources efficiently. And also we want, we want our people to know, our patients to know that this is, um, this is what's happening on this side and this is how we can improve and how we can actually save uh, and help uh, individuals and uh, also the state and the uh, federal government uh, as the Medicare and Medicaid is um, a big part of the healthcare delivery system. So Donna, uh, one of the things that, uh, what makes it also sensitive uh, with the hospital expenses other than, well, you and I, we have a horse in the race, right? So <laughs> we, we manage a, a accountable care organization and the contracts of the, these um, insurance companies. So we wanna reduce the cost and we wanna increase the quality and all that, right? Absolutely. That's, and that's I so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I just wanna say this. So I'm saying this just because we have a horse in the race. So we are being open. Now, just put that as a side, as a side and just try to see this from a different point that at least what I do. I have a picture, uh, I, I have this um, picture in my mind that someone, 82 year old, a Medicare patient with no secondary insurance. And when I look at that patient and see what that, that patient is challenging uh, with the healthcare expenses and how uh, this expensive setup that we have, unnecessary utilization that we have, how it's affecting these individuals. So this is not just business. So that's what I'm trying to kind of highlight. So we do have patients, Medicare patients. I don't know if you have, uh, uh, if you have seen these more and more these days, but you go to like one of the pharmacies and I see someone at the cashier, uh, as a cashier, she's like uh, 77 years old. This is a real story. And, you know, I have to ask like, why are you still working? And it's a part-time job. Well, because most of the time they have to pay their medical expenses. Now, um, you know, the, the, they may be seeing this as like, oh, well, he's uh, dramatizing this, but is there any exaggeration in this, Donna? Um, absolutely not. Um, we try to educate our patients, uh -huh. our staff, um, as well that, um, a couple of things. One, uh, patients, when they have non-urgent um, issues, should go to their PCP because who knows them better? Who knows their history better? It's the PCP that they've been seeing for years versus someone in the hospital that they're going to see one time. And although they can give their history, if anything's missing there, it could be something important. Um, and then again, to your other point, Kamal, um, you know, there's, there's wait time. Um, you know, it, it's important for patients to understand that we set aside a certain number of appointments every day, right, for same day um, and try to prioritize those. If we can't get you in that day, maybe it's the next day, but you're not waiting. Uh, with telehealth and you're feeling sick, you don't have to go sit in an ER for eight hours. You can um, see the provider from your own home. Um, so Donna, I think one of the things that uh, I wanted uh, you to kind of explain to us, sure. you know, the, the patient behavior is so interesting how it can be easily changed. So what we have seen uh, during the pandemic uh, time, the peak of the pandemic is how low the ER utilization was. And this is United Medical's ER utilization, especially these five, uh, last five weeks. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I see this trend, uh, what triggered uh, me to actually share this in this setting, because when you look at the state uh, COVID-19 data, they show the hospitalization going down. Mm -hmm. And that is correct. There's no problem with that. But 
the hospitalization that's not related to COVID is uh, increasing again. So can you uh, explain this to us and then what we can do? Um, yes. So um, a couple of things to keep in mind is these numbers um, show ER visits as well as inpatient visits. So when we drill down and look at that, um, one of the things that we see is you're right. During the pandemic, um, patients still had a lot of the same you know, health issues going on. Uh, they were looking at alternative ways, right? That's when we started offering telehealth, et cetera. So they would utilize telehealth with their own primary care. Uh, maybe they would go to an urgent care, but they weren't going to the hospital, right? Because uh, they, were, they were looking at that as people at the hospital with COVID, they didn't want to potentially expose themselves to someone with COVID. So to your point, that behavior changed. Now what we're seeing um, throughout this year and you know, is some of it that people are getting vaccinated. They're feeling more comfortable, right? They're opening up. Um, some places are not, are not requiring masks, although healthcare facilities still are because many patients are coming in that aren't that are sick and aren't um, vaccinated. Um, so we think a lot of it does have to do with their comfort level of feeling comfortable to go back to the hospital. But are they going for the right reason? And we do track. Um, avoidable ER visits, um, those that could be seen in a different setting. Um, so again, um, what Kamal is showing here is where we see those large um, increases. So uh, yes, from the middle of April to the middle of May, um, we've broken this down by uh, four of the hospitals here um, in, in Delaware. And we see, you know, Christiana has gone up significantly from 147 um, to 245. So over 100 cases, you're almost doubling um, what you have there um, as far as patients um, going in. We do see some increase with some of the other hospitals. Um, in blue is Bay Health. Um, Nanacoke is in the gray, but certainly not to the extent um, we really only so, saw um, an, Donna, an increase. you know, one thing, one thing on this, uh, because um, what, what actually, um, what I'm worried about. So, uh, you know, for those who may not be, who are not from Delaware, they may not know. So if you were to name one of the most luxurious uh, buildings in Delaware, uh, Normally, if you were in Turkey or in Europe or some other part of the world, it would be usually a hotel. Uh, our one of the largest building is Christiana Hospital. Um, the lobby you go in and it's amazing, humongous. <laughs> so all granite. So why I'm saying that is because I look at St. Francis, we have the same similar proportion population in different parts of the uh, state. And while people are just rushing to Christiana, uh, they are actually uh, not going to St. Francis. So, and then St. Francis, and uh, I'm a big supporter of St. Francis Hospital in the last, uh, about 20 years. Um, Unfortunately, uh, the perception of St. Francis is, oh, it's an outdated building, not like outdated doctors, outdated technology. They have same doctors, they have the same technology, but when uh, you look at the lobby of St. Francis, it's not really welcoming from the patient standpoint. And I, I just can't help but think about this. Like, are, are we really just going there to spend time? Or is there some other reason? <laughs> Huh. And I'm not kidding, actually, really. So, well, like, sometimes... because you know, why, are, why are they not going to St. Francis? Right, right. Yeah, because if you, when you were showing the numbers there, um, you could see that um, our St. Francis numbers, um, and, and we do have quite a few practices, right, in downtown mm -hmm. Wilmington. So we have a lot of patients um, who are in that area, and we really have not seen any um, increase when you look across there. Yes, there's some variations, but we don't see a spike in the last four weeks of, you know, um, more than um, 
doubling the, the numbers there. So they, they remained relatively uh, constant. Um, so uh, to so your point. So uh, yeah, that's kind of like, I wanted to point this out and I wanted our patients to kind of remember that we are available through telemedicine. Mm -hmm. uh, we are available with our care coordinators, care managers, Hospitals are uh, expensive places for preventive medicine. Please, uh, unless you are in an urgent need, don't utilize hospital services. It helps you um, with your health because um, you know the other thing that hospitals are not the cleanest places. So many people do get sick because more people, more sick people are in one uh, under one roof together. Which is why we think it went down significantly, right, during COVID, um, you know, and, and, and the point is everyone still received good care during that, that period of time, right? They did receive it in the alternate um, places. So uh, some of it is that perception and the behavior, though, um, oh, we have to go back to this. But do we really? Because we were getting, you know, really exactly. good care other places, so we don't have to go back. That's what uh, one of the points that I wanted to make. Um, now, there was a nonprofit uh, uh, aspect of this uh, today's session, uh, but you know, uh, when I have uh, when we have these discussions, uh, sometimes we have to spend enough time to make sure that we uh, register these issues. So today, uh, I don't I don't think we have enough time because we have the bariatric event starting at one. Um, so I'm going to actually cover the uh, not-for-profit uh, organizations in healthcare settings and how they are not actually not-for-profit, not most efficient. Uh, from different resources, I have some uh, good information to share. And, you know, as we are preparing, so where is Tanner? So uh, Tanner is always freaking out if you have no stuff. And I always tell him, look, we don't have we have way too much. Uh, so uh, today we couldn't even start, but I said to you last <laughs> night. So um, we'll, be, uh, we'll be doing those. So at least next week is ready. So yeah, um, right. We've we got plenty of um, stuff to go over now uh, yeah. next week. So, um, so our events uh, for Bariatric uh, Friday. Uh, we need to get the copyright of Bariatric Friday, by the way, because I came up with that. <laughs> so I would have the trade um, mark of that. Bariatric Friday will be in the next seven minutes. Uh, our uh, doctors, uh, our program director, Dr. Yerda, will be joining me. Now, uh, I'll have three of our nurses today. As you can see today, I'm just spoiling myself with a lot of beautiful ladies joining me. So, uh, but what's interesting is uh, actually Donna's uh, daughter, uh, Jessica Danko, who is one of our pre-op nurses at American Surgery Center, will be one of the nurses who is joining us. Uh, so I thought uh, if you are watching these events and you, you want to kind of see the connection, that's what's happening in the next couple of minutes. Donna, thank you so much for joining us today. I know you are off next week. Uh, we'll, I'll, do, I'll do the case conferences. I enjoy those as well. So uh, when you are back, hopefully all the patients will be healed and no one is going to the hospital. Uh, and thank you for uh, helping us, helping me to put this together. And I will see you guys in the next couple of minutes. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.